<laughs> Morning and welcome to Flaherty Fatigues. In this short video I'm going to show you all my kit and how I use it. So in this section it's all about getting your cloth onto the frame. So the very first thing that you need to do is choose a piece of cloth. Um, I most often use 100% lawn cotton. Has to be 100% cotton, no polyester. It won't take the dye. It's got to be 100% cotton. You can also use 100% sheets, slightly thicker. Really, it depends um, what you want to do and um, what really suits you. You can go thinner than this as well. I've even um, done batiking onto voile. Um, but for the work that I do, I use a, um, a, a lawn cotton. As you can see from this cotton, this one is actually slightly off-white. Um, I actually prefer that in a strange way, um, although in some of my designs I do need the brilliant white background, um, so I go for a, 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 a brilliant white cotton. But really anything that's a white or an off-white, perfectly acceptable for doing um, this type of batiking from. Uh, what you do for your treatment of your cloth is you need to strip out all of the chemicals. So once you've decided on your piece of, piece of cloth, first thing you need to do is wash it. Um, you need to wash it in something slightly more ha harsher than um, your normal detergents because you need to strip out all of the fabric dressings, anything in the fibres that, um, that have been part of the previous process. Uh, so what you can use is something called Synthropol. It is quite expensive. Um, it's the standard thing and you can get it from an awful lot of um, the batiking type and quilting type dye, dye shops online. There is another option which I've read about and I'm currently trying which is Dawn. That seems to work perfectly well. Not sure um, uh, whether there's some other stuff out there that could do equ equally well. I'm going to look into that and um, I'm most definitely not saying this is the only option. It's just something that I've read about. So for the Synthropol, it'll have instructions of exactly how much you put in your washing machine. Um, you need to wash the cotton um, at the highest temperature possible, so at 100 degrees ideally, um, or 90 degrees, whatever, whatever your washing machine will allow you to do. Put it on a nice full wash, let it dry or put it in the dryer, and then iron it, as you can see. This one hasn't been ironed. So once you've got your cloth cleaned, um, it's dried and you have ironed it, which this one isn't, you then lay it over the top of your line drawing. Um, you can, I sometimes strap it around a board, put the, put the line drawing on a board um, and, and lay this over and, and connect it to the back uh, using masking tape. Other times I'll actually, lay, actually tape it all down to a table. Really what's, um, what suits you and what you've got available to you and what's, what's most comfortable. 3B, three, three 2B two pen, pencil is the best thing to use, keep it always sharp and you just transfer your line drawing onto it as light as you can, uh, especially in the areas that you know are going to be very light dyes because you don't want the pencil to be showing and it'll be there in the early days. So I'll be doing a section specifically on how you draw up your line drawings, um, but just as, a, as, a, as, as an explanation, 3B pencil um, and your lawn cloth, you should be able to see the line drawing through as long as you've made the black lines thick enough. Next thing you want to do is then take your cloth and put it onto your frame. My husband makes my frames for me. Um, very, very simple. He could give you the technical stuff, but it's, it's just pieces of wood screwed together. Um, and what you can see from what I've done here is I've used some white gaffer tape, doesn't matter the colour, and I've just laid it, this needs renewing, laid it over the front space of the frame. The reason for doing that is, if you can probably see here, before I did it, the dye starts seeping into the wood and you can actually have contamination on um, your next your next dyeing, um, your next batik um, because the dye will seep, in, seep through from the wood. So by putting this on you can wipe this down and you won't get in contamination. That's kind of one of my top tips. Uh, once you've put your line drawing onto your cloth the next thing to do is to put it on the frame. I will be doing a short section um, on another day about exactly how you put it onto the frame stretching it but as this is just about materials, all you need is a lightweight hammer, some pins. I use metal ones because I used to use the plastic ones. They're kind of like single use because the tops, I always bash the tops off. So if you can get some of the, the metal pins, watch it, they are incredibly sharp. Be very, very careful. Don't drop them on the floor and leave them. Someone will tread on them. Um, and please keep them away from children and animals. 
Um, that's one way of doing it. The other way, which is the way I learned at school, which may be easier straight off, is a staple gun. And you literally just use that and you staple um, the cloth to the frame. Um, the issue with that is you taking it off and on is quite is quite a laborious uh, project. But if you're ten, if you're only going to work um, with it on the frame until the end, you can use a staple gun. So once you've got your cloth onto the frame, of course you want to start um, actually doing some batik. The I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking to you about how I heat my wax and what the wax is that I do heat. I use paraffin. Um, you can put beeswax in. I tend to not use it because it's unnecessary. Um, because you work off a frame, uh, cracking and, and any deterioration in the, in the wax you will deal with at the time. Um, and also, um, unless I'm actually doing cracking and I want to control it in terms of its br how, how brittle my wax is, it's unnecessary. So, because I just use paraffin wax, I actually get my wax um, in quite a large amount. Uh, it lasts me a year, um, but, and it's the most economical. It comes in granules, uh, and you can get it off, off um, you know, online shopping, do a search for it, you'll find it somewhere. But if you don't have that and you want to get started, just use a household candle. You put it into your double boiler, um, and just remember to, to remove the string um, but three or four of those will give you enough to do a batik. So now I want to talk to you about um, heating your wax and using double boilers. Please, please, please do not pot put a saucepan of wax onto your oven directly. Never ever leave your hot wax unattended. Um, and basically uh, these are the two options that I use uh, when I'm doing my batiking. As you can see I use our, our um, stove which we call Bertha so I use Bertha to heat my wax in my double boiler here um, but also in the summer when we don't necessarily need to use Bertha and we go over to more electric cooking um, I have this little gem here I've tried a number of these these are for leg waxing and I have tried a number of these and they don't last very long and they don't tend to get to the wax quite hot enough so this little gem that I'm using here has got a uh, a digital readout absolutely wonderful. I keep my wax at around 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It will really depend on a lot to do with how the outdoor temperature or the temperature of the room is to how actually high you need to keep it. If it's a warm day I can knock that down a little bit uh, because it doesn't lose so much heat going from here to your cloth. Um, but you'll, you'll, it roughly around the 200 mark is where I keep it. Um, again, even these do not leave them unattended. They have a little beeper on them that tells you when they've, they've got to temperature, but please, please unplug them from the wall. You have got something in there after all that is designed, it's candle wax, it's designed to burn. So I've had this wax heating up now for about 10-15 minutes. Obviously it depends how much wax you have on there, in there as to how long it takes to um, get to temperature. You don't need to have a full bucket, you actually would prefer not to. So here we have um, the wax that's in the bottom. This double boy works in the way that I can pull it up. Oop, a little lid. Um, take my excess build up off. As you can see, I haven't done that for a while. That can just be popped back in there. But it sits on a heating plate. You need to wipe that heating plate over from time to time because there will be wax, as you can see, burning off on it. And after time, that will wear the machine down. Um, but you stick that in there. It's on a temperature that you've preset, um, and all you do is then drop your jantings in, leave them to warm up. You obviously you've got them; they have metal on them. Uh, that metal then needs to warm up, and the wax needs to warm back up because you've taken a lot of energy out by putting cold bits of metal in it. So leave that for another five five minutes or so to warm up before it's ready to use. So um, that's the way that I'm batiking at the moment because it's a beautiful day. But as you've seen before. Uh, in previous videos, I actually use this little gem a lot. What it actually is, is the bottom half of a conventional double boiler you can find online to buy. Double boiler, in essence, just means that you have one saucepan below that's got, a, got water in it, and the other saucepan sits on top and is heated by the water and the steam from the water, not directly onto your heat source. Um, it's used quite often to make to melt chocolate and in, in, in things like that. Uh, the reason why I'm using my big 
I think it's because that's just the one I prefer and um, it's always had wax in it so it's kind of part of the family. So um, this is quite versatile, I can use it on my stove, uh, equally so I can, if I want to work outside or in a different room I can plug this, this hefty beauty in, um, put it on a very low setting, you did usually probably one between one or two just to keep the water boiling and that will do me fine. So as you can see and what I want to show in here is that this is actually the water that I use to boil my um, it's just plain water but water I use to boil my wax but when it goes cold there is obviously some wax that drips down and it goes into the water the reason why I'm showing you this and I'm going to really enjoy doing this you can then crack it up which is great um, but the reason why I'm showing you that is if you poured that water down the sink before it's cold all of that is going into your pipes so please, please, please do not put any water that's got hot wax in it down the sink because you'll clog it. Let it dry, break it up like that, then you can scoop it out um, and put it in the bin and ultimately just top up the water. Um, from time to time you'll give it a complete clean, um, but really you just take, just take the excess wax that, um, as you can see, I've been working very hard off the top and pop it in the bin. So just as a final thing on heating your wax, the importance of a double boiler. Um, if the wax gets too hot, it'll start to evaporate and then it'll burst into flames. So just as a, if you have boiling water in the bottom, you will have a lot more control over how hot the wax is at the top. Um, it won't suddenly get very, very hot on you. There is only a certain temperature it will be able to get to because of the fact that it's not sitting on a direct heat. And really, once I've got my wax um, melted, I just keep it as a, a slightly higher than a simmer. Uh, sometimes I'll have to pull, pull the heat up to make it boil a bit more if the wax is cooling too much. But really just a gentle simmer underneath constantly. Check every half hour or so there's enough water in the bottom because otherwise you're going to burn your pan and you're going to need to buy a new one. And the final point in terms of health and safety um, is that yes, the wax may well start to uh, evaporate and um, go into the air. It is vital that you keep the heat of the wax down to eliminate as much of that as possible and you work in a well ventilated area. If you have any breathing problems or anything like that, I do recommend, I know it's topical, but that you wear a mask. So in this section, I'm going to give you a brief explanation and description of all of these. So first off, I want to talk to you about jam tins. Um, I tend not to, in the work that I do, use them as much as most people. Most of my work is far less free flowing. Um, I'm a bit of a control freak and that is an indication of the fact that I use these babies. But I do use jam tins and I love them when I'm doing free form stuff. Um, they, they are, I suppose you could say they're the equivalent to a marker pen as opposed to a fine liner pen, which are these. Um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and I'm sure a lot of you are already very familiar with them. Um, one very, very quick thing, apart from the dog going through the dog flap, is that if you find your wax starts to, whatever matte wax blend you use, if it starts to go green, bluey green colour, don't worry, it's the copper. Uh, it won't affect your dyeing, it won't actually leave any impression on your cloth. It is just the reaction between the copper and your wax when you heat it. So these are my th my really my favourite tools and they're called kiskers, but I actually call them eggies. And that's because they are traditionally used to design eggs, to put designs on the outside of eggs at, at Easter. Um, they come, the ones I have, uh, which uh, I think you can buy online, if, and it should be something um, as a reference on the Jude's teaching space um, that you can go from. They come in the white, which is the finest, the blue's the middle, and the red's the thickest. In essence, see these as the fine liners to the janting being a marker pen. So one thing you will notice that there's some strange things going on. Uh, let me explain the history. Uh, jantings often f slip off the side of the wax pot into the, wa into the wax and you have to fish them back out again. Uh, one tip that I, that I picked up was that if you wrap masking tape around the top of the handle of the janting, there's enough of a, a lip there and a difference in texture to prevent it falling into the, the, into the pot all the time. So I tried that with the kiskas, but sadly the kiskas are much smaller than jantings and they were still slipping in. So eventually, look, with lots of trial and error, I came up with a bulldog clip. 
Now, when I put my, gen my Kiska into the hot wax, it just clips onto the edge and it stays and it's, it, it's at the perfect position for it to sit on the bottom of the wax pot, get nice and hot, but I'm not having to fish around when it disappears in. This one is fine. When it comes to the other um, uh, saucepan, I'm constantly pulling them out. This is, um, this is another tip. I uh, haven't perfected the um, exactly what I'm going to use there eventually. I have to get used to using it with the bulldog clip on, which isn't ideal. So if anyone's got any suggestions out there or can find a solution for it, please let me know. So, and the very final thing when it comes to how I apply my wax are my brushes. When you're putting wax onto the cloth, you need quite a robust brush. You definitely don't need one with a plastic handle because eventually the heat will get to it. So nice wooden handle, uh, standard brush. They are these are the brushes that tend to be used for oil paintings. So they have they have a harsher bristle, and of course, the standard paintbrush. So in this section, I'm going to be talking to you very briefly about how you create your dyes and how you put your dyes onto the cloth. Here are my Procyon dyes. There are so many colours out there um, that you can choose whatever you want. I tend to mix mine um, whilst I'm working. And the main colours I use, I do use other ones. I use another couple of blues often and I use a warm and a, and a cold yellow. But ultimately you could start off with is that fuchsia or magenta, black, yellow and turquoise and you'll be able to create some wonderful colours. The way that you create your chemical water, which you'll mix it with, is warm, not boiling water, hot water but not boiling water. I usually make about a pint um, and of water and what I add to it is some soda ash, about a teaspoon. I'm not terribly um, uh, pedantic about this, I'm an artist, so I put it in until it feels right to me, but it's usually about a teaspoon um, and um, you make what's called a chemical water. If I'm doing very large areas and there is a lot of waxing detail in, what tends to happen is the dye can gravitate towards the wax. By putting a bit of urea in, sometimes it seems, well, it, it seems to help alleviate that. Um, I'm sure there's other reasons for using it, but I just got some little urea granules and often if I'm doing skies and things like that, I will put a little bit of that in my chemical water. But in the main, it's just warm water, soda ash, let it cool and that will last you for about a week if you keep it in a cool place. And then what you do is you just literally dilute your dyes, uh, very small amounts, in plastic cartons, um, anything that you've got that you can recycle. Um, and a tiny bit of the dye with some water, as you've seen in my videos, until you get the colour that you like. So in this section, um, I'm now going to explain to you the tools I use to put my dye onto my cloth. These are my watercolour brushes that I use. Fat one, middle one, skinny one. That's pretty much all you need. I do occasionally use much finer ones, but really ultimately, um, these are the ones that I use all the time. They need to get washed regularly because you will get a build up of dye. As you see, that one is beautifully clean. This one, not so much. So just give it a wash with a little bit of uh, Synthropol or, um, or washing up liquid, but we give it a good, good clean and you'll get most of that out. It won't bleed necessarily back into the work you're doing, but it's just maintenance. And as these are quite expensive, I want to look after them. The next thing that I use, um, and usually for the broad strokes and especially skies, is a plain old washing up sponge. You dip that into a tray of a dye or into plain water and as you've seen with my videos, you can sculpt and you can blend really well. Keep it again, keep it absolutely clean, rinse it through every time you use it and keep it away from your washing up bowl because often I lose them because I don't remember what they are and I do the dishes with them. And once they've got oil or anything like that on them, they're useless for what you're doing. Final Final two things I want to talk about are cloths and protection cloths. This face towel, as you see in my videos, absolutely worth its weight in gold when you're doing dyeing. You can pull all stakes off before they get too far into penetrate too far into the cloth. You can take off excess water, and you can um, um, you can use it to wipe off you know surfaces and things afterwards. Fabulous. Boil them. Put them in the washing machine with darks or put them, as I do, on Bertha in a boiling pot of water and they become clean and ready to use again. And finally, this, an old bath towel. 
uh, oh bath mat sorry um, we have granite surfaces here which are cold uh, very lucky to have them perfect for when I'm doing dyeing because you can wipe them over afterwards but when I'm doing the petiquing the cold of the granite cools down the wax quite quickly um, and one of the tips I found is I just lay an old bath towel underneath my frame and it stops the coolness of the stone surface coming up and contaminating the heat that I'm putting in. Obviously, whatever surface you're using, you might want to protect it. I don't protect mine from dying because I can wipe it off, but I do protect it from the waxing. But you might be the other way around, depending on what surface you're using. The final, final section that I want to talk about, very briefly, I'll go into it in a lot more detail in another video, uh, is ironing off. I use, uh, I get off cuts of newspapers, you can get them sent through the post. Um, what I'll tend to use if I've got Bertha going is an old fashioned iron, works perfectly. You can put that directly onto another heat source to heat it up if you wanted to. But if you don't have that sort of things, an old iron. I say an old iron because you will be using wax. It will think, but if it will, um, as you see here, start to go onto the surface. One of the biggest things you need is an iron that you don't use the steam on. Absolutely no steam when you're doing the ironing off. I'll go into details of how you do it, but that's the equipment that I use, either an iron or that on the stove. Plain old newspaper. You can use newspaper that, uh, that's got printed, printed stuff on it. it. It should be okay. It might leave a tiny residue, but probably nothing that you'll notice. But because um, I use a lot of it, and we don't read that much stuff in paper on paper anymore, um, we buy it in bulk. The final thing I just want to talk to you about is this. It's not a giant toilet, toilet roll. It's, it's an indust, it's industrial um, two-ply uh, paper towels. Get it very cheaply or, and you can get it in bulk. And that for me, when it comes to all messes, keeping the wax off the cloth when you're bringing your janting or your kiska over and in numerous other ways of using it when I spill things, absolutely vital. Always got loads of it in my pockets.